Good morning and welcome to the Stryker Center. Thank you so much for coming and joining us uh, for the ninth for the ninth session of the Women on the Move author series, where we speak to female authors and we talk about their careers and of course their latest books. I am Marjorie Schuster, the coordinator of our literary events. Uh, thank you as always to the Samuel I. Newhouse Foundation for the support of this series. I am so excited and so thrilled to welcome one of my favorite authors today, all the way from her home in Israel. Naomi Reagan is the prolific author, I believe, of 12 books, I believe, mainly centering on Haredi and Orthodox women. In conversation with Naomi today is Jordana Horn of the Call Your Mother podcast on Feller.com. I'm sure you know by now, but please write any questions you have in the chat feature of Zoom, and we will try to get to as many as we can. It is now my great pleasure to welcome Naomi and Jordana. Welcome. Thank you. Have a, have <laughs> thank you so much, Marjorie, and welcome, Naomi. I'm so thrilled to get to speak with you, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I hope that we'll have a great chat together today. I'm sure we will. Great. Okay. So, what's it? What, what's going on in Israel right now? How's your weather? How's your life in Israel? You know, um, it, yesterday we had a lot of rain, and then today it's like you know, 75 degrees outside, and the flowers are blooming, and um, my garden is you know full of tomato plants. Ah. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and to be inside rather than out. Um, but I'd like to start by talking about your latest book. Um, for those who don't know, An Observant Wife is a follow-up to an unorthodox match, and it dives deeper into the relationship between Yaakov, a widower who's now married to the Balat Shuva Leia, who has come to observance from a non-observant wife. For those who haven't read it, Naomi, would you mind giving the group a quick summary of the, sto the story in both books? Well, um, the current book, An Observant Wife, is uh, my first sequel, which is a story in itself. I've never, this is actually my 14th book, and I have never felt the urge to do a sequel before. This is my first um, time that I have ventured into this, and there were a lot of uh, very unique things about the character in the book and an orthodox match, Leia, who is a secular girl who um, in her 30s is looking for love and can't seem to find it, you know, um, in the secular world. And she winds up uh, becoming a balachva and moving to Borough Park. And within that society, she felt that it would be a lot easier for her to find a serious man because religious men don't supposedly fool around with women when they go out with them they either marry them or they stop they stop taking them out on dates but you know you're not going to have a situation as you do sometimes in um, secular or even modern orthodox where you've got a guy who's taking you out and you find out you know he's taking out three other women at the same time and um, she's looking for a life. She wants children and she wants a husband and she feels that, you know, let's let's try this. And um, during the course of an unorthodox match, you know, there are a lot of different people trying to match her up. And um, unfortunately, you know, it's not a fairy tale. And um, people in the ultra-orthodox world look at those who are coming back to religion, Chosrim uh, with a sort of jaundiced eye. They're, they're not very welcoming. And um, she finds that they're scraping the bottom of the barrel to find uh, um, a person for her to go out with, you know, a match for her. And it's very upsetting. And then um, here comes along God's hand and fate uh, puts her at the home of a um, ultra-Orthodox widower who has lost his wife. He's got five kids, and the house is in shambles. And um, as a chesed, a good deed, she goes to help out this family, and something develops between the two of them. Um, I won't say more than that, um, because I don't want to ruin the book for anybody who hasn't read it yet. And um, after many things that go on there... Uh, which are very revealing of ultra-Orthodox life and of how um, people who are 
um, coming in from the outside, which of course is my story. That's where I come from. I don't come from an Orthodox family. I come from a secular family and I chose to be Orthodox. I was sent to an Orthodox Hebrew day school in Far Rockaway, the Hebrew Institute of Long Island. And it was in the course of the many years that I spent at that school from second grade through high school that I decided that um, I wanted to be an Orthodox Jew. There was no pressure. There was no pressure coming from my family. There was no pressure coming from the school. It was just the life that I wanted. I wanted to be an Orthodox Jew because I loved Shabbat and I loved the holidays and um, I just felt that secular life wasn't enough for me. You know, I I never found anything to replace um, all of the holidays and all of the things that you, all of the, um, the thousands of years of culture and history and, um, and, and all kinds of, of wonderful things that Jews have brought to the world. Um, in secular world, I mean, I used to go to the ballet, you know, I went to the opera, I lived in New York City, I went to Lincoln Center, and um, it was just, you couldn't replace these things with a ballet, you know? But you, with so much efficiency, you have tapped into so many of my questions, almost in the sequence in which I was going to ask them. Um, I want to back up a little and to go into each element of your terrific answer one by one piece by piece. So I wanted to ask first why you felt in particular that after never having written a sequel, that this story in particular needed the sequel. Well, you know, um, most of the time when you finish a book, uh, you say, okay, now I'm saying goodbye to them. It's, you know, my readers are now going to, in their imaginations, continue this story. But with this book, it was like you have this girl who's from a secular world and she marries into this ultra-Orthodox world. And you have this, this young girl who is her stepdaughter, who is, you know, very traumatized. She's, you know, 17. And she's in this situation where she's very resentful of her father. She's very resentful of her new stepmother. And... I just felt that I couldn't allow these characters to take off and it wasn't going to be any happy ending in the imagination of my readers. And I felt like, you know, if I did that, it would be like leaving a baby on the doorstep somewhere. Somebody would adopt it and bring it up. So I said, no, no, I have to take this baby home. And I have to bring it up myself. And that is what I tried to do. And um, I think that was one reason. And um, the other reason was that the characters, of all the characters in my books, Leia was most you know, close to me, myself. And I never really explored everything about it, the transition that I myself made going from a... Um, you know, a, a secular life to an orthodox life. And uh, I felt that there were so many scenes that were so great that I, I just hadn't written yet, you know? Well, we, we ended the, um, the, the book before this um, in an orthodox match at the engagement party. But what about the wedding? You know, right. what about right. the first night? Right. Well, it's, so, it, it's so funny that you say that because it's, it's also, it reminded me of... Um, I was so grateful that you did write the sequel because I genuinely felt that, you know, the same way that you put all this effort when you're getting married into the wedding, and then you want to say, what about the marriage? What about everything that comes after? And so this book, this next book really goes in, I mean, it goes in deep into what comes next. And when you talk about identifying with Leia, that resonates a lot with me as a reader because this is not, um, there is love, very deep and abiding love in this book, but there's also a lot that should give anyone pause about how eager the community seems to catch her, catch her making mistakes and to ostracize her from the community. And if it's not too personal, I'd love to ask, did, is, is that something that resonated 
with you as well? Or is that a direction that you went with your character? Absolutely. That was one of the reasons that I so much wanted to write this sequel because, you know, I don't really enjoy going over material that other people have, have you know, chewed up and, and, and spit out. You know, I, I like to try something new. And as far as I know, no one has written about what happens to um once you know they're starry-eyed and they go into this and 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 they mean absolutely the best and they they want to embrace this world but how does the world embrace them what happens to a, a, a woman who or a man who goes into this world and wants to be part of it you know uh, i think that, that was something that there's so many things in the Bible that which God says you should embrace the stranger, you should embrace the convert. I think it's 39 times that the Torah tells you to embrace the outsider. It's more than any other mitzvah. And here you have a situation where in this world where everybody's so careful and they don't want to eat this because maybe it's not kosher and, you know, they, people are, they add things on and they go into so much, you know, um, unnecessary stress over unimportant things. But this basic thing that God is telling you to do, you don't do. And I, I felt the irony of that. And I felt so much that I wanted to explore this and, and fictionally to show people this is what a religious world looks like that doesn't actually keep the laws of the Torah. You know, it's all outside it's the way you dress and what you eat and you know it's not it's not coming from a deep and important place which tells you honor the lives of the people who come to you from the outside because you were slaves in Egypt you were outsiders you should embrace the outsiders so I wanted very much to explore that aspect of religious life because I don't think anybody is actually done that you know you have a lot of books w which the person um, goes into becoming religious and then you know it, it, it's always the old cliche you know i i was religious now i'm not and i great joy in eating pig on yom kippur in the synagogue that was one genre mm -hmm. that i remember that i grew up with that was the you know religious person sees the light genre right then you had the whole reversal of that which was okay, um, you know, I'm going to become orthodox and anybody outside this is is not worth anything and, and people don't understand the ultra-orthodox world, the orthodox world. And I remember Wendy Shalit uh, in 2005 wrote some kind of um, article or op-ed for the New York Times where she said um, Nathan Englander wasn't religious enough to write about the religious world and other people weren't religious enough to write about the religious world and they were all outsiders and they had no right to talk about it. And, you know, that was another another aspect where you know it's a closed system and it you don't know enough about it and you're going to be negative because you don't know enough about it if you knew enough about the religion if only if only right you, right you then you'd be qualified you know so <laughs> right what can i say i know a lot about the religious world i am a religious woman and mm. uh, there's a lot that needs to be taken care of over there. Yeah. You know? And, 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 and that, that perfectly goes into, there's a passage in your book that resonated with me. Um, to quote, you say, the society, and you're referring to the ultra-Orthodox world, had an opinion and a rule about everything. Some like to put a positive spin on this, lauding the interference of the community that butts in, suckers, directs, lauds, excoriates, and teaches every one of its members concerning every situation they might possibly encounter in life, demanding they always choose the accepted norm. So no one would ever accuse you of not being candid because you are extremely open in writing about these tensions and yes, occasional hypocrisies that you do see within the context of religious life, a life where you're aspiring to more. Um, you know, more than the secular world, world has to offer. And I wanted to ask you, as an observant and practicing Jew, how do you feel, and personally, that tension, and how do you reconcile it for yourself? 
Well, yeah, it took me a while to figure out where I was when I became um, religious. Um, I, at a certain point at the beginning when I graduated high school, thought that I wanted to be part of the Haredi world because in, in my simplistic way of thinking, I thought, well, ultra-Orthodox is better than Orthodox because it's more. <laughs> and it's better because it's more. And then I moved to Israel and I was in an uh, a neighborhood which was um, all new immigrants, but very gradually becoming ultra orthodox. And I, I suddenly met people like I had this neighbor who was a really good friend of mine, who was mother of six kids, and she was from Williamsburg, and she was there with her husband. And um, one day she comes to me and she says to me, "You know, I I really need your help." I need my passport. My husband has taken it away and he's beating me and he's hurting the children. And I want to go to Williamsburg and I can't because I don't have a passport. So can you help me? Well, you know, that was like, it was like a, a hammer just hit me on the head because I was thinking to myself, what do you mean? You people are ultra Orthodox Jews. How could it be that your husband's beating you? I mean, how can he do that? It's so clear in the Torah that you, you're not allowed to hit anybody, you're not allowed to beat your wife. For goodness sake. And then it was like, you know, I said, well, this is one in a million. It can't possibly be that this is normal. So I chalked it up to that. And then I had another neighbor who took her three-year-old to the top of the Sheraton Hotel and jumped out of the window and oh. killed her pills and killed her baby. And this oh. was a woman that I knew. You know, we, our kids were in kindergarten together. And I and I said to myself, what happened here? What happened here? And it was like such a shock. She was also married to this ultra orthodox guy who was considered, you know, a great Torah scholar. And um, it turned out that he was a sexual pervert. He was molesting her. He was molesting the baby. Her father, who was a, a survivor, a diamond merchant in Belgium, um, refused to allow her to get a divorce because of the disgrace for the family. And I guess she felt, you know, she was pregnant with baby number two with another girl. And I guess she felt in her despair that this was the only way out. And that was the moment of truth for me as a, uh, as a woman and as a religious Jew. I said to myself, wait, it can't be that the community didn't know that this guy was molesting her. So I'm going to mm -hmm. write this book. And that was my first book. It was called Jeff Disorder. I said, I'm going to write this book and I'm going to explain to them that domestic abuse goes on in their communities and they really have to do something about it. And I expected that somebody was going to knock on my door when this book came out and they would have this laurel. They would put it on my head and they would carry me through the neighborhood on their shoulders and they would say, Yes, that, that's what always happens with any book, but, but certainly with a book that calls out people for, you know, wrongdoing, 100%. That's what I thought. I thought that we're all in this together. We all love God. We all love the Torah. And I am showing you something that you obviously don't know because this goes on all around you. You know, it's the second time I've come across something like this and this mm -hmm. must be very widespread. So, so then, you know, that was my wake up call and I started getting vilified and people called me a liar and they hated me and they, to this day, there are still people that think that I'm, I'm a horrible person because I, I began this journey um, into truth. And um, it didn't stop me from being an Orthodox Jew. All it did was open up my eyes to the fact that you can be part of the Orthodox community and be a horrible person. And to be an, you can be an evil person. You can be a huge hypocrite. That the community has um, real saints and has real scholars and has fantastic people. And it also has real hypocrites. It has people who are rapists, it has people who are murderers, and they all are under the category of ultra-Orthodox Jews. You know, it's the- uh, right. right. And uh, you know, I think, that I, I don't know you personally, unfortunately, although apparently, you know, my six children and I are coming to stay with you in Israel. So that's very exciting. Oh, yes, um, <laughs> but um, I am so impressed by the there's and I think that anyone listening to your last answer would perceive this, but I'll I'll say it explicitly. I'm impressed by the fierce streak of justice and of looking for justice that underlies 
all of your stories um, because it, it really, your stories are not only, they're not only fun to read and they're not only riveting in terms of their plot, but it does feel that you're inherently compelled to tell these often untold stories. And so I'd like you to, to talk a little more about what you hope to accomplish by telling those stories and what you feel you have accomplished in doing so, besides arguably a pile of hate mail more than what you what any person would hope for. Well, you know, as an Orthodox Jew, you read the Torah and again and again it said, the thing that resonates with me as an Orthodox Jew is the Hebrew saying, tzedek, tzedek, tildof, that you should pursue justice. Now, I often wonder, why does it say pursue justice? Why does it say be just, achieve justice? And when I started writing these stories, I understood that you can pursue justice, but you're never going to catch it. It's always going to be right ahead of you. You know, you can tell people that there is domestic abuse going on and uh, they're going to say, no, it's not true. Why are you making up these terrible stories? And what they used to say to me all the time was, you're washing dirty laundry in public. Mm. You're washing our dirty laundry in public. And, and once a rabbi said to me, you know, if you don't wash dirty laundry, it really begins to stink. <laughs> so, you know, that was always my answer. And I, I really believe it is part of my religious belief that um, when you see a situation which is an unjust situation that you are obligated religiously to step in and try to make things better. Now, the whole question of domestic abuse was very far from me because, you know, today, by the way, is my 52nd wedding anniversary. And I'm married um, to my... Mazel tov. I am married to my first boyfriend, and I adore him. And we've had four kids together. We have 14 grandchildren together. And this story of, of women who are abused by their husbands is something which is very far from me because, you know, and a lot of times people would write to me and say, well, you know, you, you must have personal knowledge of this in order to be able to write about it. I said, no, absolutely not. I am married to the best man in the world, which is why. I can talk about these things because I have the privilege of being in a wonderful marriage and I can try to help women who are not. And so um, when I began writing these stories, I felt like, you know, a woman doesn't have a bima. She doesn't have a place in the community, in the religious community. She can get up on, you know, Shabbat morning and say, you know, this terrible thing happened in our community and we really need to do something about that. Only rabbis get to do that. So I said to myself, you know, you want to be a writer? Build yourself a bima. Let your mm. book have a bima. And stand up and say all the things that are going on in your community and in your heart and in your life. Try to make things better. And I tell you, I think that I have, in a certain extent, I am convinced that I've succeeded because when I started, there wasn't any, uh, you know, home for religious women who were being abused domestically. And now there are shelters for Orthodox women who are being abused. There are rabbis' conferences on Orthodox rabbis' conferences on how to deal with domestic abuse because before I started writing. You know, the, the person who started the um, the first woman's Orthodox woman's shelter, Rabbi Corman, uh, he found a woman sleeping in a hotel lobby and she was an abused woman. She had no place to go. So he rented an apartment. And that's how he started this wonderful thing, Bat Melech, which is something I'm involved with and support. And it's it's an unbelievable um, uh, situation where he he is able to gather these women and, and put them back on their feet. And and. You know, this situation that I see, because my my books have brought this to the fore, he used to have people saying, I'll support you, but don't tell anybody what you do. Don't come out in public and say there's a need for this, because that's embarrassing. And, um, and now everybody comes to visit all these politicians and everything and all these rabbis come in. And it's like they, they used to say, you don't need these shelters because in our world, there aren't any abused women. Why would you need a shelter? Why would you right. need a shelter for abused women? There aren't abused women. So, so now 
least we can say they're abused women. You know, you you start out with an idea that hits the community like a bomb, which was mm-hmm. denounced abuse among ultra orthodox Jews and religious Jews. It's not only the ultra orthodox; it goes, you know, everybody has this problem. It's just yeah. that religious people is hidden because it's embarrassing. So here I was, stupidly, naively, as I said, I thought people were going to be grateful to me. I come out with this and I tell people what's going on and it hits the community like a bomb. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, that was 30 years ago, I wrote that book. Right. Little by little, right. by little you know. There is change. No, that's it, right. And I, I love your I love your metaphor of building a bima and of speaking from that bima. Um, and so you're writing about these religious communities for um, what maybe I incorrectly assume, but I'd love to hear your take on it, is an audience that in significant part is secular. Um, and so can you talk about the choices that you've made and how maybe you feel about being designated as a kind of ambassador to a world that is not as religious? Well, um Actually, everybody reads my books. <laughs> I get letters from <laughs> non Jews. I didn't mean to impute anything else. <laughs> I, I, letters from non Jews. I get a lot of a lot of uh, information from ultra orthodox Jews, and I, I was very surprised. You know what inroads my books have, have made in the ultra orthodox community? Because mm-hmm. uh, I was once I once had to do a, a death notice for my father in law, which was only printed up in certain areas in Mea Shalim, which was super, super ultra-Orthodox areas. And I was designated the one to go down there and stand on line and go into this ultra-Orthodox man's house. So he would print up this death notice that was a while ago. And here I am, and I'm start getting, giving him the information. And, you know, the, my books are very popular in Israel. You know, I was once called the third most popular writer in Israel. I don't even write in Hebrew. I write in English. And, you know, the... The, one of my books, the first one I had published was on the bestseller list for 90 weeks and everybody was reading this book. My husband went to the army and there were people in reserve duty who were reading this book. Men, you know, it was unbelievable. So I'm standing on lawn and I go in there and I tell him my name and he looks at me and he says, wait a second, are you the writer? Did you write that book? And I'm thinking, oh boy, I'm not going to get out of here alive. And he says, you know, I read that book. And I'm looking at his, you know, his peyote and his black hat and everything. He says, you read that book? I'm like slabbergasted. And I said, so what did you think? And he said, well, it, it helped me to understand my wife better, he says to me. So <laughs> I, I oh. but, but that just showed me that, um, you know, you have an audience which is um, not one kind or another. And that is, that is what literature does. It opens up a world to um, everybody, you know, and, and, and you think, well, ultra-Orthodox people know this. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't know this stuff. They only know what they, you know, uh, been told or maybe what happened to their neighbor. But when you, when you create a place for literature, that is what connects everybody. It, you mm-hmm. connect the ultra-Orthodox world to the, to the, um, to the secular world. And what I find that was most gratifying is that people in Israel, there was a great divide between religious and non-religious people before I started working. And I won't say that I bridged that gap completely, but when people started reading uh, my first book, um, Sota, in the musings of an ultra-Orthodox girl as she's on an Israeli bus looking at a soldier, a, a girl soldier, and thinking what a different life she had. And how would it be to live that life? And people afterwards told me they started to look at religious women differently after that because it was like, look at the thoughts they have. They're, they're so much like us. They, they're not that different. You know, they, they, they're Israelis. They're like us, you know. And, and so we, I think the book helped to bridge that gap. And, and what happened, which I think was something you couldn't imagine happening. You know, before that book came out, I had a sub-agent in Israel. And mm-hmm. the book was published in America, Sota, 
and um, I wanted it published in Israel. My first book, Jeffy's Daughter, I was a little nervous about, so I didn't want that published, but I bought the second book, you know? So um, the sub-agent who uh, passed away when it was Ilana Picardi, and she was a very well-known agent, she tells my agent in America, there is nobody in Israel who's interested in a book about ultra-Orthodox women. There's just no interest whatsoever. And um, I was I was flabbergasted at that. And I said, well, you know, why don't we just remove her from this picture and I will go to uh, the publishing houses in Israel who are interested in this book because they'd already contacted me, um, not through my agent, but just because I live in Israel. And so one of the, Keter, which was the, is one of the largest publishing houses in Israel, published that book. And when that book came out, it was on the bestseller list, as I said, for 90 weeks. So there was this perception that there's no interest, that the secular world is interested in the ultra-Orthodox world. And I think, I think that part of the opening up of the of literature and um, movies and um, television to stories about the ultra-Orthodox world began with my book. And, and I'm, not because it was, I think, of course, it was a wonderful book, but it wasn't that. It was because the book was successful uh, commercially. So, and you actually, you actually forged those connections. Um, people who picked up your book, regardless of where they, where they were on the religious spectrum, where, whether they were Jewish at all, the stories resonate with them um, and open the door to an experience to which they hadn't been privy before. And that, that leads me into, I wanted to know if you find that anything has changed in how people view your books in the wake of the what you predicted, I would say, um, the popularity of shows like Shtisel and Unorthodox, both of which, like your work, brings ultra-Orthodox practices into a more mainstream audience. And, and could, could you, have, first of all, have you seen the shows? Do you watch them? Um, and what do you think about the phenomenon of their popularity? Well, I think nobody's happier than me. <laughs> that, that that these books, you know, that there are other authors writing books about the ultra orthodox world. That there you have Shtisel, which I think is a wonderful show. I love that show, and um, I, I watched it religiously. I, I thought it was so well done. Um, Shtisel doesn't handle the kind of material that I handle. Shtisel is very kind. They don't take on controversial subjects. You don't find wife beating on Shtisel. You know, you find you find good kind people living in a good kind world, and I think that's fantastic. It's a great, you know, contrapuntal. You know, it, you need you need something like that. Um, you've got all of these movies coming out, which which is like you know, every aspect in the ultra orthodox world has been looked at with a magnifying glass. You've got you know lesbianism and homosexuality and wife beating and whatever there is. Now, sometimes I don't like the stuff that I see. You know, there was this horrible movie called Price Above Rubies, in which, mm -hmm. you know, it was just, she falls in love with a Puerto Rican and she's raped by her brother-in-law. And she's, you know, it's, it's one of these, you know, I'm happy eating pig on your kipper in the synagogue genre mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of stories, which I absolutely hated. But this is what I think. I think that, what I'm most proud of and happiest about is that I have shown that the ultra-Orthodox world is worthy of literary exploration, that it is a deep, rich place for any author, for any um, screenwriter, for any playwright to enter, and the material is as complex and as interesting as any other society in the world. And I'm very happy that that has happened. And, and the more people going into that and exploring that, the more points of view that we have, I think the better off we are. So I'm, I'm really very happy about that. And uh, as far as people um, then turning and saying, well, you know, I love Shtisel. I'm going to read something by Naomi Reagan. I don't think it works that way. <laughs> you know, uh, people, people, I don't think my books are really um, on people's uh, radar. Um, now any any differently than they were before all this happened. And mm -hmm. I find, actually, I find that surprising because, um, you know, I, I'm waiting for somebody to say, 
well, you know, she was actually the first, you know, <laughs> her books actually opened up the door to all of this stuff. And um, I don't see that. I don't see it happening. But so what? And, you know, um, you can do anything if you don't care who gets the credit. So I don't care if I get the credit for it. I know that that's what happened. And I and I think that um, what it achieves is that in, in, a, in a while, when there are more and more things coming about out about the ultra-Orthodox world, there's going, we're going to achieve a certain balance. You know, it's like in the beginning when they started writing Westerns, it was always about the cowboys and the, and the terrible Indians. And, and, you know, the pendulum swings up and back. And so the more things that are written about that world, the, the more um, equilibrium you get, the more honest the picture is. And um, so I think it's enough for me that this is now considered a, um, a legitimate place to place a novel or a play or a movie. But this is a world of great complexity and great interest. And um, it's something that people are interested in. And um, I think this interest is a good thing. And I think it brings us together as Jews also, because there's all these divisions in, in, in the Jewish world, and not to talk about the divisions between the, the, um, the non-Jewish world and, and the Jewish world. And, and very interestingly, the non-Jewish um, the readers that I have are always the most complimentary. They're always writing me, wow, you know, I didn't know Jews were so wonderful. And it's, and it's the uh, religious Jews or the um, or just Jews in general who write me, how could you say such terrible things? What, were the, what will the, the non-Jews think of us? You know, what will the Gentiles right. think of us? We should right. write these things. Right, the Shonda for the Goyim. That's right. That's right. Um, and I, I, I could talk to you for, I could talk to you forever. I want to make sure that I get in some of our viewers and listeners questions as well. Um, Tara asks, I'm now reading your latest book, The Observant Wife, and you wrote that Leah took the preferred hand of the rabbi as he was leaving the wedding. Are rabbis exempt from the law of not touching women? I have also, I've so enjoyed many of your books. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out um, where this happens in the book. Page 14 is what she says. <laughs> so, and. Um, which rabbi is this? I don't, I don't know. I just have the question, so well, I don't know. But we can come back to that if you'd like, because because uh, Valerie also asks if she can enjoy the second book without having read the first. I don't know. Uh, rabbis are, first of all, not exempt from uh, the laws of touching women. Um, I'm trying to remember which rabbi there was in the book that touched a woman at the end of this wedding. I'm going to go and look at that, look that up afterwards. I'm sorry, I honestly can't answer you now <laughs> because I don't remember that. Okay. And um, Sheila asks, she says, I get that you love your religious life. So why do you write about the lives of women with what seems to me to be such anger? Okay. Um, you know, a lot of times people say this, um, why are you writing such negative things? Why are you writing about things that don't work out? But if you read my books, you know, you'll see there's a balance. Yes, there are characters who are, um, are in good trouble, and then there are wonderful characters that help them out. Um, I'm writing a book, I'm creating a world, and in that world, there are good people and there are bad people. And they interact. And um, you can't have a world which is only one-sided. You can't say, which is, I think, ultra-Orthodox people especially are used to reading books that are published by Feldheim and Art Scroll. And in those books, all religious people are walk on water. They're all wonderful. Nobody ever does anything wrong. And they're all kind. And, you know, this is, this is a... I always call this the, um, you know, the Snow White stepmother syndrome. You know, you read a book and you, you don't want to see your face. You don't want to see what's really going on. You want to be told you're the fairest one of all. Well, wow. that's a bit of a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. I write all the stories about real people. And I, and I love being an Orthodox Jew. And um, in being an Orthodox Jew, I found a lot of Orthodox Jews who are Blatant hypocrites, wife beaters, um, 
cheats, thieves. Um, I found a lot of negative things in that world, which doesn't stop me from being an Orthodox Jew because I know there are very wonderful people in that world. It's right. all the real, the real world. And um, I write about these things, the negative things, for one reason and one reason only, because I believe that it is possible for things to change. And I believe that bringing this information forward to Jews who are trying to live a religious life and trying to keep the Torah will perhaps get them to say, you know, I'm going to donate money for this women's shelter or I'm going to talk to my neighbor whose husband, you know, I hear them shouting all the time. And I'm going to, I'm going to get involved in this because it's my religious obligation to make this a better world, the world that I live in. And I'm not going to sweep things under the carpet because that's not right. And mm. you show this in fiction. And I think maybe, maybe people can, can get something from a fictional world that speaks to them in a way that, uh, you know, a nonfiction book can't, can't do this. And right. perhaps it will convince them um, that there really are things that need to be improved. And if I didn't think that world would be improved, believe me, I wouldn't be writing these books. I would Thank you. That's a, that's, a, that's a terrific answer. Um, Seidel asks, I thought the Haredi community doesn't read secular literature. Do they have to sneak in your books? Um, well, you can't buy my books in an ultra-Orthodox bookstore. Um, I have sometimes gone into, they have bookstores in Jerusalem that sell religious books like Pomerantz bookstores, and he actually sometimes carries my books. But if you go to, uh, I have been to um, stores in Mea Sharim and things like that, and, and they, the, the bookstore owner says to me, you know, I'd love to carry your books, but they burn my store down. So I understand that. But people buy the books. They read them, and you you can't stop people from opening their eyes and opening their minds. You know, the, the whole idea that you can hermetically seal people in a society um, went out the window with the cell phone. And even before the cell phones, you know, 30 years ago, people were reading my books. And... Um, they don't admit it. Sometimes they don't admit it. They say, no, 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 no. We would never read her books. So they're, you know, they're, um, they're pasul. They just can't do that. It's not right. And they read them anyway. So I think that um, there's a lot of um, hypocrisy about this uh, as far as people admitting to reading stuff. But we're all like that, you know. Did, did you ever read a book that you don't want anybody to know that you read? You know? <laughs> Right. The Kindle can really the Kindle can really help with that actually since the cover, you know, not right out, but sure. Right. Um, Karen asks, she says, so your books eculate, excuse me, educate secular folks about the Orthodox community. Do you think there's a way to educate the Orthodox about the secular world? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, that's good. I think that um, with the advent of the smartphone. Um, people are, well, I think the rabbis are pretty hysterical about it because that's exactly what people in the ultra-Orthodox world are getting. <laughs> They're getting an education about the secular world. And you don't need anybody to write a book. All they have to do is open up their cell phones. And uh, people see the news. They see what's going on. They read whatever they want to read. And, um, you know, the books are available. And um, so that's that's a real revolution that's going on today. The fact that uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews who used to be in this hermetically sealed, you know, rabbinically um, sanctioned environment are no longer within it. And the rabbis have lost control completely. And every once in a while, I see there's a huge rally and there are, there are posters in Jerusalem that said, can't bring poison into your house. Do not bring in cell phones. They can't fight it. It's a lost cause. You know, everybody's got a cell phone. Everybody in the Asherim has got a cell phone. You know, they say it's a kosher cell phone. You can't reach certain um, certain websites, but everybody's got a cell phone. And if you're talking about education, about the secular world. Well, you're going to see the results of that very soon because there, I won't say that there's an exodus from the ultra-Orthodox world, but there certainly is a big shakeup. 
And um, you've got a lot of organizations that are involved in helping um, ultra-Orthodox Jews transition from the life in that community to uh, a normal religious life or a secular life. And you've got you know, Hillel in Israel, you've got a whole bunch of organizations that are helping them to do that. And I think that's the result. It's the result of, of the education that the Internet is giving them about the um, secular world. And I hate to say this because um, I don't like the way it sounds, but I personally believe that um, almost all Hasidic groups, if not every single Hasidic group, is a cult. It's got all the earmarks of a cult. You know, I, I know that that's a controversial thing to say, but I did a book about cults, the Devil in Jerusalem. And as I was writing that book, I thought to myself, wait a second, look at all these earmarks of a cult. You have an infallible leader. You're not allowed to question. You know, everybody has to do the same thing. I said, well, that doesn't that characterize every single Hasidic group mm-hmm. in the world? So I have to, I have to interrupt you because I just got a question about the devil of Jerusalem. Um, Brenda says Naomi Kolakavod for writing the kinds of books which give us so much insight into the ultra orthodox community. I loved an or- unorthodox match, which is someone else's question about what the name of the book before was. So there's your answer. And an observant wife. I just finished reading The Devil in Jerusalem. I could not put it down, but I was so horrified I couldn't read parts of the ending. I understand it's a story that needs to be told, but what compelled you to make this important story so graphic? Well, this is what I thought. I said to myself, this is in the newspaper. The the information about, about this cult, for people who haven't read the book, this is a true story that I got from the newspaper about um, uh, religious Olim Americans came to Jerusalem and somehow fell in with this um, Hasidic cult in which the head of it was a psychopath and he wound up um, he wound up throwing the husband out of the home um, seducing the wife and um, brutally brutally hurting those children. He turned the three-year-old mm. into a vegetable. He, he beat mm. him so badly. And I said to myself, how many of these cults exist? And I went to this organization, which is the Cults in Israel organization, that deals with cults. And she says to me, there are hundreds. There are hundreds of cults like this all over Israel. And I said to myself, what? Hundreds that are under the ages of of religious life, you know, and I said, people don't know about this, and it's a horrible story, and I don't want to write this story, but how else am I going to explain to people who want to be, you know, they want to they want to be drinking the purity at the you know the watering holes of holiness in Jerusalem, and they don't understand the predators that surround these watering holes, and these cults are the predators. How can I explain to them how to protect themselves so this never, ever happens again? You know, they just, but there's this cult, you know, that, that's been traveling all over the world. You know, um, they, they got kicked out of Canada and then they went to Guatemala. And this is the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I bring this to the attention of the Jewish world that if you want to be an Orthodox Jew, you can fall into one of these cults. Mm-hmm. Not that wears a beard is holy. You know, you, you. Right. Right. So, uh, right. If anything, you actually you talk a lot in in your books about how how responsible women are for much of the day to day work that infuses that that makes it possible to go from day to day at all. Um, and Cheryl asks, does Naomi ever feel restricted or not valued as much as a man, either in her religious community or more broadly? Well, you have to understand where I'm coming from. And um, I'm coming from a BA in English and an MA in English, and I'm married to an educated man, and um, we both entered religious life as um, educated uh, Jews. And um, so to feel devalued uh, because I'm a woman, certainly I don't feel that in my personal life. Do I feel that in my communal life? And, And the answer is sometimes yes. Because in my communal life, as I said, I don't have a bima. 
I don't have any place where I can stand up and tell the community what I think. And uh, since I started writing my books, however, I feel that I've created a certain uh, sense of equality between myself and between um, um, other people in uh, my religious community as far as expressing and disseminating my opinion is concerned. And, um, and so that feeling that I was not being allowed to speak has disappeared. But I still think we need to make bigger, better efforts to allow religious women um, an equal place in the community. The, the last thing I saw, saw yesterday, is there are religious women who want to take the um, test to pass the test to be rabbis. And they, mm. the, the, the chief rabbi has said, well, well, we're willing to test them, but we'll give them a special test in a special place just for women. And they said, no, thank you. We don't want that. We want the same test in the same place that the men take. And the only reason we want this is to show that our knowledge is not less than theirs. So you, you still have to fight for these basic things. In the right. And, they, right. They, and Roz asks if um, if you think Haredi women can gain more leadership roles within the context of municipalities and the Knesset and is in Israel. Um, I think in general, all women should have more role. And uh, I think that there is certainly among ultra orthodox women, you know, they banded together in the last election, or was it the election before that? You know, there's so many elections, it's hard to keep track. But they had a party which was um, run by ultra orthodox women, and they had their own candidates because the ultra orthodox men's parties would not allow them to run. So they said, okay. We'll start our own party, and you can vote for our candidates, which will all be women. And there was a certain amount of hysteria among the ultra-Orthodox men when this happened because they expect their wives to be rubber stamps politically to any um, any anybody that they vote for. They automatically assume their wives are going to vote for that. But, you know, this is an interesting thing is that the voter booth is closed and nobody can see who you're voting for. So um, Ultra Orthodox Women started this party and um, there was a great deal of upheaval when this happened. Now, I don't think that their candidate actually got in, but wow, what a wonderful beginning. I was so proud of them. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is the beginning. And I'm hopeful. And one viewer um, notes that today um, a survey came out that predicted that Israel would be 30% Haredi by the year 2050. And do you think that, does your experience bear that out? And if so, what do you think of that? Well, um, it's possible, you know, anything's possible. But, but I think when you make predictions like that, it's very difficult to know um, what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, they kept predicting that the birth rate among um, among Arabs was going to outpace the birth rate among Jews. And this was like you know, 15 years ago. They told you demographically Israel was going to be taken over. And that's why we had to, you know, do all kinds of things. And uh, that didn't turn out to be true. The birth rate of the uh, among Arabs went way down and the birth rate among Jews went up. So what's going to happen and how many, as I said, how many ultra-Orthodox Jews are going to figure out that they're in a cult or that they don't want to be part of this anymore and they're leaving, you don't know. And, and right now I can tell you that the birth rate is not among ultra-Orthodox Jews what it used to be 30 years ago because um, people grow up in families with you know, 10, 12 kids and guess what? They don't want to have 10, 12 kids. They want to have three kids or you know, two kids when they get married. And I've heard many ultra-Orthodox uh, women and men say that. They say, you know, we suffered a lot. There was a lot of poverty. And mm -hmm. when we get married, we don't want to have 10 kids. So I I think that um, that's up in the air. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do think is that the um, Internet is going to bring uh, many um, ultra-Orthodox Jews face-to-face -face with the modern world. Mm -hmm. And that's going to change everything. 
Right, and Karen asks, isn't it somehow more meaningful if you do know what's going on in the secular world and you still choose to remain Orthodox? Oh, um, I never became Orthodox because I didn't know what was going on. I don't think she was asking about you specifically. I think she was asking more about people generally. In other words, you know, their commitment. Um, well, to, I, I think that if you look at the ultra-Orthodox world and the religious world and you look at the secular world, there are places where they intersect and places where they do not intersect. And mm -hmm. the uh, lack of intersection um, is where a person makes a choice about how they want to live their life. And um, I personally, seeing what's going on in the secular world, I'm very happy that I brought my children up in the religious world. And um, mm -hmm. I see many things going on in the secular world that I don't agree with. And uh, especially today, we were talking about um, all these controversial issues about sexuality and people being able to choose their sex and um, all kinds of things that seem to me over the top. And I think the pressure on young people, um, you know, in, in this particular environment, I'm very happy that um, my children don't have to go through that. Um, Myrna, Myrna wants to know if you consult rabbinical sources when you write or if you're just extremely well-educated religiously. She admires your erudition. Oh, uh, people used to ask me, do you have, did you take your book to a rabbi to get a hechsher before you had published mm. it? So that's a similar, a similar question. Um, the truth is that I have 12 years of religious education. I, uh, after high school, went to the Sarah Hebrew Teachers Seminary in Boropov. And I have spent the last, I don't know, 50 years in Israel um, in uh, studying the Torah. And um, I don't know if you would consider that extremely well-educated, but um, I certainly do study. And it's a lifelong passion uh, to study the Torah. And um, I, everything that I put in my books um, are things that are easy for me. They're things that are part of my life. They're part of my education. I don't need to, can you know, go to a rabbinical, uh, you know, authority to ask questions about things that have been part of my life for fifty years, sixty years. You know, so um, I would say I write about what I know. And, I that's a good and you do it so well. We have so many people asking: Is she working on a new book? When will it come out? And what is it about? Oh, very good. Good question. Yes, I am. As a matter of fact, writing a new book. Um, it is due to go to my publishing house at the end of uh, October um, next year. And hopefully within a year, it will be published because it takes about that amount of time. To mm -hmm. publish. And um, it is nothing to do with the work of this world. I have a completely different story. It's a story about um, a Nazi hunter and a child of perpetrators who meet and explore the territory between them and what does it mean to be a child of survivors, a child of perpetrators? What does it have to do with our lives today? We who are so far removed from what happened during the Holocaust how do we deal with the past? How do we um, treat each other? And um, what is it going to mean for our children? How, do, how are our children going to relate to all of these things? Do we have permission to explore these things? Permission to forget these things? Permission to, um, to hate? Permission to love? What do we have the right to do with this legacy and this heritage that has been handed down to us in this horrific way? And um, believe me, I'm struggling with this material and all the things I said, I have no idea what my answer is going to be. And that's the beauty of writing a book because you can find out what you think. And I'm now exploring what I think about all of these subjects. So thanks for asking. And thank you so much. Um, it's been such a pleasure and um, really looking forward to not only um, not only your future book, but also going back and reading your past books with the knowledge that we've acquired in this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jordana. This was a great interview. And I want you to know I'm a big fan of yours. I read that article <laughs> about you in lockdown with your six kids. <laughs> How I laughed. That was so marvelous. And oh. I think you're a great mom. And you oh, thanks. Great. Thanks. Well, we all can't. You'll, you'll see it in person in a few years in your house. So. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. I, 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 of course, want to thank both of you. First of all, Jordana, you are a fabulous moderator and very good questions. And Naomi, we could all listen to you for many, many hours. Everybody learns something. I also will go back and read a few of my favorites. And it was really inspiring. I was texting back and forth with different people telling me how much they were enjoying this the entire time. So it was wonderful. And one of them is the rabbi from our temple who was so thrilled and watching the whole time. Had a few questions that were answered along the way. So I hope we can get you back to Temple of the Temple Manual Striker Center. Naomi, you were with us once three years ago, maybe? Something like that. And uh, I hope well, we, you can come back for your next book. And I Thank hope we can all be back. Thanks Pardon? So Thank you so Great. much, Mark. It was a pleasure to be here. And I love the Stryker Center. And you have the most interesting things going on. And um, I appreciate it. And I'm very honored that you asked me. Oh, well, thrilled to have you. And I just want to tell everybody who is watching us, um, the 10th uh, author in the series is next week. It's Francine Prose, uh, 1130, November 30th. So that will be lovely as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and uh, we hope to see you again. Thanks thank again. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.